I want to thank the conveners for inviting me. It's actually a great privilege to stand here on behalf of the ISCO community and so many people contributed to this work and I put only a few of them on the abstract. So this talk is about ice cores and CO2 measurements and stable carbon isotope measurements. So as you saw from the previous four talks, so we know much about, about the CO2 concentration of the current carbon cycle in a very high temporal and uh, geographical resolution, although it's difficult to, to solve all these questions. From the past, we only have reliable CO2 concentrations measurements from Antarctica. So we have basically a single point because only ice from Antarctica, Antarctica is clean enough for this purpose. So why do we actually measure CO2 on ice cores? What is the, the purpose? So a, a very simple one is just to get CO2. And because CO2 is a, a major greenhouse gas, so knowing CO2 in the past, you can run climate models and use the radiative forcing and the orbital forcing to get a model output run climate models in the past. And the, the second purpose is a, is a very trivial one as well. So CO2 is mainly a diagnostic parameter to, to pin down all the processes so influencing CO2 both in the, in the ocean and also in the terrestrial bi biosphere. And especially for this diagnostic purpose, we need highly resolved ice cores and, and also very long ice cores. Do you have a big picture? And here, because it's a, a talk on ice cores, I want to just briefly introduce. So when you have an ice, ice sample, you have, you have bubbles, and in contrast to the, to the ice itself, which has a, a very discrete age, you can often layer count the ice core, so the, the bubbles have instead a broad age distribution. In case of the, the EDC ice core, it's an it's a ice core on a low accumulation site, and you see here that the, the width of the age distribution is broad, so you, with this kind of ice core, you, you cannot derive a very highly resolved record on centennial resolution. And the, the reason for that is actually the, the fern column you see here. So fern is a porous medium, and in this fern, air can easily exchange from the atmosphere and the, the fern. And how does it work? So we, we start with this red square. So it's, it's snowfall starting in the upper part, and then the, the snow layer is transferred downwards with the accumulation rate, vertical velocity, and a few bubbles already enclose very early, and these bubbles actually form the broad tail of this distribution. But most or more and more bubbles form in the lower part, so we get this part, and most of the bubbles actually form in a very narrow depth range about 10 meters, and these make up the bulk. But so this is the reason you get a broad age distribution and you, you cannot annually resolve CO2 like we can do currently. And you can imagine if you have an ice core site where you have more snowfall, then processes are faster and you get a much narrower age distribution, which is very useful to derive ice to, to measure high resolution records. Yet, uh, in the past, often drill sites were chosen to provide very long records, like the famous Vossel record, which informed us about uh, the last four glacial cycles. You see that CO2 varied during the glacials around 180 and during the interglacials to 280. And Vostok has a real broad age distribution, so not suitable for any high res highly resolved records. And, but people wanted not only to know the, the concentration, but the, the processes behind. And then the, the race began to, to come up with higher resolved records. So the, the first in this was the, the EDC record, 
as you can see here. EDC is, is not really useful for this purpose, but people measured as dense as possible with the size scores and came up with the um, Bonin record you see here. So the last um, deglaciation, deglaciation part. And already at that time, so it's 13 years ago, we saw that the CO2 rise during the deglaciation was not constant or gradual, but it was somehow somehow quicker, and then you have plateaus, and so already at that time we saw, though it's, it's a complicated story. And yeah, but afterwards, the years to come, so people measured the, the deepest part of the core to, to get the CO2 concentrations also for the lukewarm interglacials, and it turned out that these lukewarm interglacials had also less CO2 in the atmosphere. In the years to come, the race was to, to measure even higher resolution during the glacial part. So there were many studies, different ice cores, with now higher accumulation rate and narrow age distributions. And these ice cores now allowed to look deeper into the, the fine structure of the CO2 concentration in during the glacials. And as you are aware, so we have all these, these wiggles. And these wiggles are um, caused by the bipolar seesaw mechanism. So this is shown here. So when Greenland is cold, then CO2 warms. And there's, there's a striking relationship between the duration of these Greenland stadials and CO2 release. So it's it's a bipolar seesaw mechanism, and the, lots of papers dealt with mode changes and how this millennial scale um, process worked. And so the, the final step was to replace the old EDC record with a much higher resolved record from Waste Divide, which is perfectly suitable for this ta task because it has a very, very narrow age distribution. And so again, we see the, the old EDC record, these, these phases shown here. And now we plot in the new C2 measurements from Waste Divide, recently published by Sean McCott. And on the first side, you see here, oh, it doesn't really fit. But it's, it's mainly a problem of the EDC age scale, because EDC has a low accumulation, so it's, it's really difficult to come up with a, a good chronology in these cores. So we zoom in to see this. So we, we do see some, some mismatch on, on the age scale. And the second feature is that there's, there's a slight offset on that. And I will just shortly discuss both of them. And now the, the EDC is plotted on a, on a new time scale. And then it's, it fits better. And but the problem is you, you, it's just you can decide which age scale is better. And, but now with the waste divide I score, which is actually layer counted, and with a narrow age distribution, really can pin down the ages and also help constrain the distributions or the, the chronologies of the other cores. So I will jump over this. So this basically says that for, for a certain depth at the EDC course, the, the chronologies of the last 10 years came up with quite different numbers. So it's, it's, it's really huge. And the, the second feature is there's a slight offset in the CO2 measurements. And it, it's not really clear what, it, what is the, uh, the reason for that. But EDC was measured actually in bubble ice while um, the waste divide record was measured on cluttered ice. So it could be that its ice properties are related to the extraction devices. It's not clear. And so what is the, the record actually showing? So the, the deglacial part was divided in three modes instead of four um, intervals. So we have a, a gradual 
CO2 increase. And then we have plateaus. And these plateaus actually occur after these rapid jumps in, in CO2, which are visible in ice cores during the, so for the first time, because EDC is highly smoothed. And now I zoom in into that. And so we have three jumps. And so CO2 is jumping in, in just 100, 200 years by 12 ppm. And these jumps are simultaneous with methane jumps. So this points to a n more northern hemisphere um, cause of these jumps. And so AMOC changes, so changes in the North, North Atlantic um, circulation. And recently, there was put a, a different alternative for that. So it could be that CO2 is actually released not from marine processes, but by terrestrial processes. And Peter Kuhl and colleagues, they, they thought about, oh, it could be permafrost, actually, thawing and releasing organic carbon. And this could help explain the carbon-14 mystery during that time interval. So I, I leave it there and jump in the remaining minutes to the, to the carbon isotope story, which runs in parallel. During the 80s and 90s, people thought, oh, this carbon cycle is way too complex. We need more constraints. And one constraint was carbon isotopic composition of atmospheric CO2. And as you can see here, uh, carbon isotopes are, are a nice tool to difference among processes and also reservoirs. And a few years later, the first pioneering studies popped up. And one study was uh, along the Holocene and one from the, the last glacial. And the, the paper for during the Holocene, it states that CO2 rise is somehow linked perhaps to a terrestrial release of carbon, which is climate-induced. So on this point, they, they made of this stand, the, the statement. And Wally Brock actually wasn't really convinced about that. He said, oh, this theory just rests on shaky data. And I'm not really convinced and until you come up with a, with a better data set. So then ISCOP people went in the lab, and it took them yeah, many, many years. And the first follow-up study in this game was over the Holocene. And indeed, Wally Broker was, was right. So it's a, it's a flat line. So it's, it's not carbon released from a terrestrial biosphere. It's, it's the ocean, basically, what this study says. And with this, we could also yeah, rule out Rudiman hypothesis that it's the increase is due to early land use changes. Uh, a few years later, we could extend this record through the deglaciation, and the, the, main, the main result was actually, oh, it's the, the initial rise and this rapid drop in carbon isotopes is actually due to Southern Ocean processes, so upwelling, to, to make a long story short. And yeah, it was again Wally Broke who said, oh, hmm. The carbon cycle is way too complex to come up with such a simple statement. And so we, and then he said, oh, you have to think more. So, and Wally said, oh, we present only a, a roadmap what must be done to interpret this record. So it, he admits it's, it's complicated. But he says, oh, it's likely the, the dust. So look, look at the dust. And so this is a roadmap, so you have to think about lots of things. You, you can't actually constrain in the deep past. And, but we, we didn't give up, so we measured further. So we measured during the, the previous interglacial. And during the last two years, we filled up the, the gap between termination two, termination one. And it is Sarah Eggleston which, who filled up this, this gap. And perhaps you saw a talk on Tuesday. So yeah, just one minute. And so we, we tried to 
look at Wally's uh, dust. And so as you know, in the, in the middle panel, I plotted the, the dust. Here's a dust record actually from my scores showing that during glacial maximas and also during this four cold period, there's lots of dust deposit, deposited on Antarctica. And this is actually nicely seen also in the marine sediments. So in, in a core in South Atlantic. So it proves that what is de deposited in, in Antarctica falls also in the ocean. So it, it, it could be that a, a fertilization effect is really at play at that, at that thing. And if you, if you align, actually, so it's, it's not really convincing just to make wiggly matching, I know. Yet, you, you see here, so when, when CO2 rises, actually, so the, the dust is, is dropping rapidly, and you get a drop in, in carbon isotopes. And if you, if you look at termination two, so CO2 rises, and the dust drop is just in the middle, and you get something different. And during this four, so dust is dropping, CO2 is rising, and you, you get a huge drop. And I think I'm, I'm done with the time. So you, you see it's, it's really tricky in the deep past to come up with these complicated questions. And, ah, sorry, uh, can you go back? No. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so, in summary, I had three parts. So, the first thing is you need a proper ice core for each purpose. So, a high accumulation site when you want to have centenary or centenary resolution, which is possible with a waste divide ice core. And you need low accumulation sites for get a really long record. And in part two, I tried to, to say that the high-resolved high, high CO2 records really allow to think more on the, on the processes. So, and in part three, so you saw the, the, the help of the carbon isotopes in, yeah, okay, I'll finish. <laughs> Thank you.